Like the creature at number 10, the Jinn. The Jinn is known as Genie in English, but the Jinn, sometimes spelled D-G-I-N-N, they have deep roots in Arab culture. The Jinn first popped up on the scene from stories told by Indian, Persian, and Arabian storytellers. They gained a whole lot of attention and fame internationally when they appeared throughout the tales that Sherazadi told in the Thousand and One Nights. It is said that jinn are created from fire and they can take on any form that they choose, whether it's animals or humans. They can also be any size that they feel. And most jinns, by nature, they're very hostile. Although you'll find some that can be very, very friendly. Moving on to number nine, we have the Kareen. The Kareen is a personal companion jinn that exists opposite of you in the invisible jinn world. The word in Arabic literally means constant companion. So literally they're stuck with you. In a sense, it's like an immaterial demon that sits on your shoulder pretty much and starts telling you to do bad things. The Korean, they latch onto a person at birth and they can be very jealous of anyone who tries to get close to you. Yeah, they can be very protective and cause a lot of harm and mishap to somebody that tries to get your attention too far away from them. The Rook comes in at number eight. The Rook, also spelled R-U-K-H, or in Arabic, R-U-K-H-K-H. This is a gigantic legendary bird that is said to carry off elephant and other large beasts for food. This creature was mentioned in one of Sinbad's stories in The Thousand and One Nights. And usually it's described as whitish in color. Its wingspan is said to be 48 feet in length and its feathers are as big as palm leaves. The rock was so big that its eggs were said to be over 150 feet in circumference. And according to Arabic tradition, the creature would only land on the mountain Kaf in the center of the world. Next up, let's look at Al Anka. This creature has nothing to do with demons though, but it's also a supernatural creature. It looks like a gigantic bird and it can fly away with anything that it carries from animals to humans, anything really. And the name in Arabic means the one with the long neck. This creature was mentioned in the ancient Arab legends and books such as marvels of things created and miraculous aspects of things existing. So yeah, another legendary bird that made it to this list. Moving on to number six, we have Falak. Now this is a creature that is said to inhabit the underworld and it's actually gonna come out when the world ends. Now this creature, it looks like a snake, but not like a, a regular snake. Like, this is a massive snake. And the Follock's job is to torture sinners. And this is all taking place after the world ends, by the way. So the Follock themselves, they reside in the seventh hell below everything else. And it's said to be so powerful that only its fear of the greater power of God is the only thing that prevents it from swallowing up everything that is created above it. Yeah, pretty scary, guys. All right, halfway in at number five, we have the Nas Nas. Nas Nas are creatures that have the form of a man, but split down the middle, and one half is completely missing, and one half has the tail of a lamb. So it's like some half human, half animal looking creature, and this monster supposedly originates from the Hadramaut region in Yemen, and some Nas Nas are described as having wings of bats. Number four brings us the were hyena. Were hyenas are pretty much humans who turn into hyenas. Kind of like werewolves, humans that turn into wolves, except in this case, they're hyenas. However, the mythological creature is larger than a hyena and it can stand on two legs. Yes, pretty similar to a werewolf. They are also known to be very deadly and brutal and ruthless creatures. So if you ever come across any one of them, Run. Ghouls come in at number three. Ghouls are thought to be zombie-like jinn who haunt graveyards and they prey on human flesh. They are completely demonic and they're incapable of doing anything good. They're often portrayed as nocturnal creatures who just come out at night. And ghouls are capable of changing form, but you could always spot one if you look for one particular sign, and that's that they have hooves like donkeys and they actually aren't able to change that. Well, so they say anyways. Ghouls, they roam the desert and they often disguise themselves as very attractive women. And this is to distract travelers so that they can come closer. And once they do, they eat them. Number two brings us to the Ifrit. 
Ifrit are intelligent and very cunning. The Ifrit are also known to live in very complex societies similar to human beings. So they're like elevated forms of jinn and they are said to prefer caves and underground dwelling places. Although they are very demonic, they are portrayed as being able to change and are capable of becoming religious and good. They emerge as smoke from the ground and form into large winged demons and they're said to be able to bleed fire. And the scary supernatural creature of the Middle East coming at number one is the Bahamut. Bahamut, also called behemoth in English, is a massive fish creature who serves as the supporter of the world in Arabic cosmography, which is a study of the origins of the cosmos. Also in Hebrew mythology, Bahamut is a large land-dwelling creature and it's the largest one that has ever been created on the earth. Bahamut is currently lurking in the underworld and he will return during the chaos and the destruction that's going to happen during the Day of Judgment. Also, ancient mythology states this and I quote, All of the waters in the world placed in one of his nostrils would be like a mustard seed in a desert. Yeah, that just gives you an idea of the massive size of Bahamut. At number 10, we have the tradition of Tolbi. Now, Tolbi or Tulba is a private event in which only the closest relatives of the bride and the groom are present. Now, the groom formally asks for the bride's hand from her parents. This tradition takes place after both families have agreed to the marriage proposal. Both families give their blessings to the groom and the bride, and the Surah Fatiha is recited. And this is recited by everybody that's present at the event. After that, tea is served with sweets to enjoy and celebrate this whole new agreement, this marriage agreement. Number nine, we have engagement. Now, engagement is also known as khutbah in the Middle Eastern countries, and it's a ceremony in which the bride and the groom, they exchange the rings. So putting the rings on each other's right hands is a very common thing to do. Bride and groom also wear matching color clothing as well. The engagement is pretty much just like a wedding party or dinner party which is arranged by both parties. Now, moving on to number eight, we have Radwa. Radwa is a small event which takes place one or two days before the actual wedding. In this small event, male relatives from both families, they go into the bride's home and take care of anything that needs to be done in terms of decorating and setting things up and all of that. And they also make sure that the bride's parents have a great time in this ceremony. The groom's relatives, they make sure to resolve any issues before the wedding and the eldest man from the groom's side congratulates everyone and gives his blessings. Another cool tradition is the tradition of henna. I love these things. Henna is probably the most common wedding tradition in the Middle Eastern and Arab countries. The bride's female friends sing the Arabic songs and they draw henna on the bride's hands and feet, sometimes other parts of the body as well. There's even a henna night. Henna night is just like a bachelorette party for just the females. The friends and family, they dance and sing songs about the bride's new future. They have drinks and food as well, of course. Men also have their own separate party where they you know, typically do things like dancing to traditional music. Qatab al-Kitab is the tradition next. This is another Middle Eastern marriage tradition. It is a wedding ceremony in which both families sign the marriage documents. The Sheikh or the Ma'zun lays out the conditions and the rules of the marriage and specifically in Coptic Orthodox Christianity as well as in the Ethiopian Tewahedo Church. Brides and grooms are dressed up in royal garments, sometimes wearing capes and crowns and jewelry even. The couple are each given a candle to hold in their left hand during the ceremony and this represents their beliefs in Jesus Christ as the light of the world and that they will be guided through life by the teachings of the church. The couple's right hands are then joined by the priest as a symbol of unification. Zappa comes in next at number five. Zappa is a traditional dance that is performed in weddings in Middle Eastern countries, especially in the country of Lebanon. It's like a grand entrance celebration for the newlywed couple. Now the tradition starts with the bride's father bringing his daughter to the groom and during this whole event the band of drummers they play traditional Arabic music and in some traditions actually the rings are changed 
to the opposite hand. You'll hear female relatives performing zagruta. Also traditionally, male and female dancers, they perform a special dance wearing special clothing to welcome in the couple. And also this is a pretty popular thing, so much so that it was recently adopted by Beirut as well. In some weddings, the Zafa performers will carry the bride on their shoulders and bring them to the event. Let's look at Dabki at number four. Dabki is a folk dance performed by professional dancers in some Arab weddings. Wedding guests also join the dance and dance in a circle. However, one thing to know is that in Egypt, instead of Dabki, belly dancing is done to entertain the guests. For number three, we have Barmet al Arus. This is a farewell that's given to the bride and groom before they leave. Now the couple goes into a beautiful decorated vehicle and the relatives and the friends, they follow the couple to their home and play loud music to let everybody know that this couple just got married. They're making a whole lot of noise up in the streets. Let's move on now to number two, and this is Moroccan kaftan. Moroccan weddings are among the most traditional in the region. During the ceremony, which can last from three days to a week, depending on the financial situation of the couple, and it also depends on the region that the wedding is happening in. But the bride wears her best kaftans in the form of a coat or overdress, usually reaching to the ankles and with long sleeves. And finally, number one, we have Egypt's honeymoon. Honeymoons in Egypt differs from one part of the country to another. When we look at the countryside in Egypt, the newlywed couples, they rarely travel for their honeymoon. Instead, they stay home for the first seven days of their marriage before entertaining friends and families who come to see them, bring them gifts and food, as well as anything else that they might need. But when you look over into the urban parts of Egypt, married couples, they commonly spend the first night of their honeymoon in a hotel, and that's where they celebrate their union before they travel to a resort. It could be overseas, or it could be a local resort, like traveling to their Red Sea, for instance. And starting at number 10, we have Fatouche. Well, what is this anyways? Well, it's a Mediterranean fried bread salad, and the salad, for the most part, will have lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, radishes, and of course, it'll have fried pieces of pita bread. But you aren't really stuck to just using those vegetables, though there's no real set rules to follow but what you need to have a thousand percent like what you gotta have and include is the pita bread because without them then you're literally just eating salad so if you don't want to insult the name of fatouche toss in some pita bread and by the way speaking of the name the word fatouche in the arabic language comes from the word fate which literally means crumbs to heat up the bread you can fry them in a pan with a little bit of olive oil Oil and lightly season them with some salt and pepper or you can bake them for 10 minutes or so if that's what you prefer. Kibe comes in at number nine. Kibe is made of bulgur cracked wheat, minced onions as well as ground beef. You can use lamb or goat or camel meat and it's also topped with spices. It can also be formed into patties so you can also bake or cook them in a broth. A common way to eat them is just dipping them into something, taking a bite, mm, delicious. The next food we're gonna be taking a look at is cherry kebabs. Now I'm sure all of you have heard the term kebabs before, but I found out that cherry kebabs are a very popular food in the Middle East. It originated in Aleppo, Syria, and it was mainly made by the Armenians in the area who called it fishna, meaning cherry kebab. They also go by the name kebab karaz. Now typically they're formed as small lamb meatballs that are browned and simmered in pitted sour cherries. Also raw cane sugar is added as well as pomegranate molasses. Now one of the tips that I found when it comes to making them is that if you can't find fresh or frozen sour cherries, you can use dried cherries which you can then rehydrate by soaking them in water overnight. At number seven, we have one of my personal favorites, baklava. This one had to be on this list. Now I can eat these all day, every day. This sweet dessert pastry is made of layers of phyllo, which is a very thin unleavened dough used for making pastries. Now it's filled with nuts and spices and it's drenched 
in syrup, one of the best parts of baklava. Now the word baklava comes from the Farsi term for many leaves. Now there are many variations of baklava and the walnut filling is a very common way to make it. It's very common in the Levant. Also pistachio or almond fillings are very popular over in Iran. You can also find baklava in the Greek culture as well. Number six brings us to Om Ali. Now it's sometimes spelled Om with a U-M-M -M instead of O-M. And this term actually means Ali's mother. Om Ali is an Egyptian classic, pretty much Egyptian bread pudding for the lack of a better term. But instead of bread, it is traditionally made with big puff pastries, phyllo or roa, which is Egyptian flat bread. And it's combined with milk and nuts, coconut flakes, sugar and raisins, it is then baked in the oven until the surface is golden brown. These also have a very interesting backstory. How the story goes is like this. Om Ali was the first wife of the Sultan Is al-Din Aybat. And when the Sultan had sadly passed away, his second wife had a dispute with Om Ali, resulting in the second wife's passing. Now to celebrate this, Om Ali made this dessert and distributed it among the people. Moving on now to number five in this video, we have Kanafa. Now this is another popular Middle Eastern dessert. Yeah, we have quite a bit of desserts on this list. I know I was a little bit biased when I put this list together, but anyways, all these foods are amazing. Like many other desserts, this is very sugary and it's layered with cheese and pistachios. Now in a bowl, you would mix cheese and sugar together. Traditionally, Akali cheese is used, but if you don't have any, then mozzarella cheese can work just fine. Also in another bowl, you would throw in some shredded phyllo dough. And if it's frozen, make sure it's completely thawed out first. And then you mix that together with some butter. Then you place the dough on a pan and top it with the cheese mixture. Then you bake it until it's brown and then you pour syrup over it once it's all baked. And then you finally sprinkle some chopped pistachios on top. Like honestly, this looks so good. Seriously guys, if this doesn't get you hungry just looking at it, then you shouldn't be eating food. Just stop it. Just stop right now. Don't eat anything else. <laughs> I'm just saying. Moving on to food number four, fatayr. Fatayr is a Middle Eastern meat pie that can alternatively be stuffed with spinach or cheese, such as feta or akali cheese. Now, it's also described as a cheese bread, and the reason for this is because there are a couple types of fatayr that can be made. One way to prepare it is kind of like a pizza where you would top the spread out dough with cheese and bake it. And another way is is that you fold the dough and then you stuff it. Now I did mention some cheeses that are used but fatayr can be made with halloumi cheese which is a kind of a hard cheese and it's made from a mixture of goat's and sheep's milk. Also labne which is Lebanese cream cheese is used in these. Three more foods to go and the food that I had to throw in at number three is hummus. Like literally I could not make a video about Middle Eastern foods without mentioning hummus. Even if you've never heard the term Middle Eastern before you've heard the term hummus this food has become popular all around the world and now the word actually in Arabic means chick Peas. But what many people don't know is the full form of hummus is hummus bi tahini and that means chickpeas in tahini. But if you're among the rare people on the planet who just don't know the term hummus in general, let me break it down for you, okay? Hummus is a dip or spread dish made from cooked mashed chickpeas blended with tahini, lemon juice, and garlic. Sometimes people sprinkle some other herbs into it. But it's really good, it's very simple to make, and it's so good that I literally eat it sometimes by itself. I don't know, is that weird? Guys, I can't be alone on this. Let me know down below if you eat hummus by itself too. Number two is baba ganoush. And baba ganoush is pretty much eggplant blended up with lemon juice, tahini, and sea salt. Typically, you have to char the eggplant on a grill or over a flame of a gas stove. And I always like to look into the meaning of words, guys. And surprisingly, in Arabic, Baba means father and ganoush means pampered or spoiled. And I found a pretty interesting backstory associated with this food. According to Arabic folklore that's believed to have originated in Syria, there was a daughter who mashed all of the food that she cooked for her elderly father who didn't have any teeth, so obviously he couldn't chew food properly. Now one of the vegetables that she mashed up was eggplant and then she added in some olive oil, lemon juice, as well as tahini. And this led to the popular baba ganoush 
Ganoush that we have today. Also, one thing that I really gotta mention is that Baba Ganoush is healthy, it's gluten-free, and it's completely vegan. I know a lot of these foods that I mentioned in this episode contain milk products or meat, and usually it's eaten with pita bread, crackers, or some type of chips as an appetizer. Now, that was number two, but at number one, and there's quite a bit of reasons why this next food is number one, we have shawarma. Like, where do I begin with shawarmas, right? Okay, I've been eating these for years now, and it's one of the most popular street foods in the entire world. This dish is made up of meat slices roasted on a slowly turning vertical rotisserie, and the sliced meat, whether it's chicken, lamb, or beef, or whatever, is all packed into a large piece of flatbread or pita. Now, the word shawarma means turning, of course, in reference to the rotisserie. Now, now inside of the flatbread wrap, you'll also find hummus, veggies, as well as other sauces. You can kind of customize it and just sort of like make it to your own liking. Like, I mean, literally, like people go crazy with this. Like I know here in Canada, there's this thing called shawarma poutine. Poutine is fries with cheese curds and gravy and the chicken is added to it. Whew, Lord. Honestly, if I could eat that every single day, I would. Shawarmas, like I mentioned, they are super popular around the world. I've even heard them referred to as the Middle Eastern version of tacos or burritos. But whatever you want to compare them to, I don't care. You can always find these anywhere on the planet, pretty much. And whatever you spend on a shawarma, it'll be worth every dollar, trust me.